and the Interim Executive Director at the National Museum of Industrial History. And it's wonderful to be able to host this great event every year on the former Bethlehem plant site. So how many of you have attended Steel Weekend in previous years? Nice, okay. So this year we have a very special focus. We are delving into where steel making begins and taking a look at the mining and coking processes, which are just so critical to the steel industry. How many of you here worked in the Coke oven division? Charlie, yes you do too. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been told that this was the best place to work mostly by the folks who were here. Right? And it was the best operation in the Bethlehem plant. Right? So let's learn a little bit more about this little known, sometimes misrepresented, yet essential work in the steel industry. So I'd like to introduce the workers that we have here. Um, the gentleman standing next to me is Charlie Luthar, a graduate of Lehigh University in chemical engineering. He started as a 1966 looper in the Looper program. He was the first, uh, first placed in the Coke oven division where he stayed for almost four decades. And he became the superintendent of the Coke oven division. I was asking some folks what year that was and they thought it was pretty early. Was it in the early 70s? No, it wasn't that early. Somewhere around the 80s. I, I okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> and he stayed there uh, until 1998 eventually retiring as a senior engineer in environmental services in the early 2000s. And so we have, I have a list here and it's not in order. So we have Dean. This end was kind of assembled uh, ad, ad hoc or whatever you want yeah. to say here. Yeah, so let, me, let me pass the mic. And actually, Charlie, would you like to introduce everybody? Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, I'm really not, very good at this kind of stuff, but uh, I'll try to introduce the individuals by their name and then hopefully you have more information because my brain isn't too good anymore. Mm -hmm. Dean Smith in the 411 maintenance group, uh, uh, years of service, Dean, lots of 20 years of service. And you work primarily in the oven section? Yes. Okay, Jimmy Kish. Jimmy was also 411, um, that's a Coke oven maintenance group. And how many years did you have, Jimmy? I think it's on the list, but... 31. 31 years. So you're an old-timer. Eddie? Eddie Ruth worked uh, at the Coke ovens for probably a little longer than that. And he also worked in the coal chemicals area um, for quite a period of time. So how long was it, uh, Eddie, that you were at the... I'll in steel 34 years. Yeah, because you worked also in the rolling mills, I think, right? initially when you first started, but then you realized uh, where the God's country was and you came down to see us. <laughs> Tommy Marrero was also in maintenance, and Tommy, uh, how many years did you have? With 32 years. So a lot of guys with a lot of service time. And you were uh, in 411 as well, in maintenance? And 512. And in 512 initially, right? Yeah. So that's where a lot of the folks started from and then migrated to different positions in the department. Uh, the next fellow to him, uh, you've probably seen him and you've certainly seen Carmen this morning, uh, who really is going to hopefully say a few things about the mining area. No, they're not going to do that. You're going to do that. Uh, Nelson Matos and his better half is Carmen, who is sitting in the audience there. Nelson, another maintenance guy. Uh, but you came from treatment, right? Treatment department initially? Two, couple, eight, and ten treatment. two eight, and ten. And you spent how many years there, Nelson? In the company? A little bit over 30 years, something like that. a long time. Almost all of that actually, uh, well, I shouldn't say almost all of it, but a good percentage of it was at the Coke Ovens. Going, Eddie Serrano. You know, I always can remember Eddie because one of my favorite peppers is serrano peppers. <laughs> I can remember Eddie all the time. Uh, very uh, jovial fellow and very uh, pleasant to deal with. And uh, how many years, Eddie, did you have? 
30 years. So that everybody's pretty much in that same uh, area in terms of service time. Now we come to the senior citizen of the uh, group here, Ishmael Garcia. Ishmael uh, started in 1953, and you told me earlier you actually started at Five Battery. Number Five Battery came on at the Coke Ovens on August the 19th, 1953, which happened to be my birthday, but it wasn't that year, it was earlier than that. And you were a heater on A Battery uh, before you retired, Ishmael, right? You were on all of the batteries, because you were... Not, not all the elements worked on everyone, because the A battery was the, the, the new one and half a new system. So I used to work in everyone. I used to be a changement at all, at what time. So I used to work in everyone. So you got to know all of the operations from the oldest batteries to the newest battery and saw them all. The heater position was the top position actually in the oven section in terms of operations. Um, they were generally the, the most experienced because they came up through the ranks through all the different positions starting off as a lidman. And I was told that when I first started at the Coke ovens it was a lidman. It wasn't a lidsman, it was a lidman. I was straightened out by the superintendent on that. But he, he worked in all of those positions coming up which was important to know so that you could do the jobs that eventually became the, the heating uh, jobs. And Guillermo, Guillermo, you're gonna fill me in because it's been a while since we talked. How many years of service did you have with the company? 27. 27 years, and you also uh, had- I was in maintenance 411. Yeah, you, but you had most of your service at the Coke Yes, right? I worked, I started, I started in the steel in 73 in steam, water, and air. And then I went to uh, Central Tool for an apprenticeship and then in 79, I went to the Coke Works. Finally figured out the best place to be. He wanted to come down with us. <laughs> Finally, my dad said, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uh, parental relationships. And I don't want to forget Joe over here. Joe was administrative assistant to me uh, in the office. But you also worked in 411 uh, initially and a couple of different jobs. And then you took a transfer to Burns Harbor. Worked about four years out in Burns Harbor plant until about 2001. So I think, yep. Um, so I had about maybe 28 years total. So there's a lot of uh, new faces here that we're not, uh, we weren't really aware of uh, initially to be on the panel, but I think you've got a great representation. You can we invite like Johnny to build up here? Yes. Can, you, can we encourage yes. Yes. Yeah. Please give him a round of applause. Yes. Yeah. Come on, we'll bring this here. Sure. Oh, there, there it is. Over here. about when the Coke oven plant started? I can say something, Here. but I don't know how much time do you have. Well, just do it. let's just do two minutes, and then we'll go into the film. Two minutes? Just a little We've been there for 86 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's a synopsis. That's a synopsis. Uh, first Coke ovens at Bethlehem uh, started with Lehigh Coke Company in 1912. They actually became Lehigh Coke Company in 1910 and was consolidated at that time. The batteries were built by a German company, two German companies. I can't pronounce them without looking at it, but one of them is BMAG, who still is in operations. Uh, Berlin, Althausen, Maschinenbrau, Aachen Gesellschaft or something or other, I can't remember that. And the other one was uh, a brick company, Schmott, uh, DDA, Vorn DDA, which was a brick-making company. The Germans came up with a very sophisticated design. And again, this was a new operation for Bethlehem plant employees who really weren't very familiar with Coke ovens at that time. You know, there were a lot of experience with steel mill operations, but not Coke ovens. Coke ovens are unique. You're talking about an operation that is basically a refinery. 
so that all of the jobs from the bottom to the top have some technical knowledge that you have to have. And when uh, those batteries started, um, the first push was on August the 2nd of 1912, but those batteries only operated for about two years, and then they were replaced by Heinrich Copper's ovens, which is a newer generation, a better generation of ovens, more automation on it because you could control the heats and do things on the, on the refractories that you couldn't do with the original German design. Uh, part of the problem with the failure was brick. Uh, they, the Germans felt that the problem was the American coals, that the American coals were too aggressive and they caused damage to the refractory. And what it really was is that the heating had to be higher and the Germans installed fire clay brick, which was not a good brick. Silica is what you should use and use only fire clay at the edge of it. So those were the first batteries. They were replaced by four Coppers Beckers, I'm sorry, not Beckers, Coppers ovens uh, in 1914 to 1916. Later, number one and number four of those batteries continued to operate, but a new set of batteries came in during the war years, the Coppers Beckers design. These are all differences in the heating design that Ishmael and, and the heating guys would know best about. Uh, they operated right through to the end our last uh, day of operation was March the 28th of uh, 1998, which happened to be my oldest daughter's birthday. So I could remember that date, but at one o'clock that morning when we finally uh, shut down it was a very sad time, even though it was my daughter's birthday. Uh, the batteries uh, had some tremendous people. The, the ovens, the Coke, Coke ovens, had some tremendous people working. And you see many of them here in front, but there are many others, there's some in the audience yet, that really uh, helped to make the plant what it is. It was a very sophisticated operation, and it took some really talented people, and we had some great ones. We've had 25 reunions. Our last reunion was two weeks ago. We had 83 people come out for that reunion. And it shows <clears throat> the family style of the people. People care about each other even after the jobs were gone. Uh, and at the very first, there was a fellow by the name of John Zamplar, who was a heater, that mentioned in a newspaper article they were interviewing that the Coke ovens was basically a family, is what he called it, and it really was. It was a great operation. A lot more on the Coke. Um, there is a sample of Coke up here. You can take a look at it later on. And there's some other models. That, and I guess I'm going to turn this over so, to you. This is a video. All right, that was a good introduction. Now we're going to watch a video that was produced by the Bethlehem Steel Corporation. Um, just a few minutes here. It's a short video about the Coke ovens. It was the early 1900s, the time of prosperity for the nation. And for Bethlehem Steel, it was the beginning of a transformation from a single steel plant into an industrial giant. Steelmaking began here at the Coke ovens, where coal was turned into Coke for the blast furnaces. Coke making got its start in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania uh, in 1912, when we pushed our first Coke with Lehigh Coke Company being the operating arm of the business here. Lehigh Coke was an independent entity separate from Bethlehem Steel that produced the coke for Charlie Schwab's blast furnaces. And uh, they operated as an independent company until February of 1917, when Bethlehem Steel bought them out. The company was started by two German firms, funded by Deutsche Bank. That really was how this point got its start. Starting at coal handling, we're the, the first step in the, the process of, or making of coke. We receive all incoming coals from different mines, primarily West Virginia mines. And I like to uh, refer to it as baking a cake. Um, no matter uh, how good of a baker you have, no matter how fine your ovens are, if you don't put the proper ingredients in and in the proper amounts, the cake will never turn out well. Coke making is a process that turns coal into coke. The coal heats in large ovens for 18 hours or more, reaching final temperatures of about 1900 degrees Fahrenheit. Cooking drives off impurities in the coal, leaving the high-quality carbon that supports and melts the raw materials in the blast furnace. 
The blast furnace is the beginning of the steel making process. Coke making is like nothing else you'll find anywhere in the steel business. We make an awful lot of products in addition to Coke, byproducts such as tar, ammonium sulfate, light oil, and sulfur. Those are our principal products. We sell those to various people that turn them into finished products. Anything, like in the case of light oil that goes into making benzene and toluene and xylene, you can find them in paints, you can find them in everyday products like cosmetics and dyes, and pantyhose and everything of that sort. Coat making has changed since the early 1900s. Once a dirty operation with few environmental controls, coat making is now a high-tech operation with state-of-the-art equipment to clean and control pollution. Over the past 24 years, uh, when I initially started, I came down to the Coke ovens in 72, and it was one heck of a place. It was quite dirty. If you could have seen what, the, what has occurred since 72 to present, you would be amazed. It's, it's just amazing. Now, I've been involved in the bricklaying department since 76 and in labor construction for most of my career at the steel. And there, there's a definite commitment to the community and the area as a whole. Bethlehem has invested well over $60 million in trying to improve the environment for the community and for our employees. We've invested in things like a shed for pushing emissions control, a similar type device for pushing emissions control, a two and three battery we call a chemical car. In our areas of coal chemicals, we've included a lot of vapor control so that the noticeable odor that used to exist around coke ovens is no longer there. We've controlled a considerable amount of organics that would be odor producing. We're now containing them, collecting them, and processing them through our process. Well, a lot, a lot of changes have been made. I, I got answer for that because I live in Ellertown, and 33 years ago, when I walked, opened up my back door, I smelled the coke plant. Now I don't do that no more. It's much better. I think the company did a lot for the environment. Uh, I've been working 13 years at Coke Works, and um, it, the atmosphere, as far as you know, it's a lot better than what it was years ago. The years ago, the cars used to smell, and the cars are a lot better now. They work on the batteries. The the lid men, you, you couldn't even see them years ago. Now it's it's fairly clean, and uh, it, it's a good place to work. I've been working in this, uh, in the Coke Works for 32 years, but for the last, probably for the last 20 years, I've been a tire chaser. But when I started here, it was really dirty here, really dirty. And then about 15 years ago, I say, our place is clean enough. I think we have a very aware workforce. They're aware of what the regulations are, and they really are trying very hard to comply with all of those regulations. Uh, we've done a lot of training with our employees. We've gone through environmental classes in schools, seminars, many times in the past. We keep trying to bring everybody up to speed with the latest in what's going on in our business and in the external regulatory environment. We had a Coke seminar that was put together by the uh, management down here at Coke. We went for a week and they taught us a lot about the business end and the environmental end of it and the impact that it could have on what we're doing how it could really change things. We went through training programs on spills, leakage of doors, you know, the top of the ovens, you know, and all of that. We, we went through training on that already. And proper equipment to wear as far as what our clothing and respirators, we have were respirator fitted, the type of respirators that we should have in the, the areas that we work in. It's all available to us as long as we use it. I think what you see here today, which was different than what it was when this facility got started, is the quality of the work life of the people that are employed here, and also the quality of the environment that we're working in. The environment has changed tremendously, not only because of regulations, but because people are more aware of the need to protect the environment and the effect that that has on their community. And there are an awful lot of people that work here at this operation that are from the local community, from Bethany, from Allentown, Hellertown, the Greater Lehigh Valley. So they are interested in what's happening here and what we do about the environment. That's probably the most noticeable change. I think you'll find the, envi the environment for the employees also has changed. Where we had uh, lesser working conditions in the past, I think you'll see that things have improved to make things better for the people that work here. I think people in the Lehigh Valley have to realize that we definitely have a commitment to the environment. I live in Whitehall and most of the people live in a relatively close proximity to this plant. 
So we have a self-serving interest to keep this place clean. We, our children and grandchildren are going to be living in the area. And I think the community as a whole should realize that we are making efforts and strides in keeping this place running, running the way it should run. Not just because of the incentive not paying fines, but we are good citizens. I think coke making has a very bright future here at Belfie. I think as long as everybody pays attention to the points of quality and environment and making the job safe, I think we will have a very long and prosperous future and be able to supply our quality products to our customers for many, many years to come. From its humble beginning in the early 1900s to its sophisticated high-tech operation today, Bethlehem's Coke ovens continue to produce high-quality Coke for our domestic and international customers. Our employees take pride in our history and in our vision for the future. So thank you. That was 1997. A couple of uh, people on that video looked familiar. So, um, basically, as, as Charlie noted earlier, the Coke plant was a chemical refining plant, and it began with a need for fuel for the blast furnaces. But uh, what were some of the other interesting co-products? Instead of byproducts, we've been talking about co-products. What were some interesting co-products that were produced? Perhaps. Ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate. I'm going to pass this to you. Go on. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, I worked in a, out of the Benzol, so uh, I got around a lot of this stuff. It was ammonium sulfate, which some of you probably know is fertilizer. You use that as fertilizer. We got tar. And we got sulfur, and we also have one time, at one time I'm thinking they used to use some of our gas to cook in the city of Bethlehem, but they don't want to use coke gas anymore. And there, there are other things that come off of it that probably nobody knows. But uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. yes. Was it the rock wool? I think I remember many years ago. Oh, getting wool. 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 Is that a byproduct of the coke or what? Is that next door? Yeah, yeah down on so the eastern off our parking lot, yes. Uh, did they buy something from you to make that? Or? No, but were you, we used to go in and service the, the equipment that was needed. It's made from slag. They aerated the slag and it turned into the rock wool. I guess it was used in a lot of applications. I don't know how much of that is being used today anymore. A lot of times the uh, iron makers could reuse some of this for iron units into their furnace. But they used something from your plant to make that, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I, I tell you what, I worked in that slag in the yard. <coughs> in My brother-in-law worked down there. Yeah. But I, I was like 16 years old. <laughs> And I did it between, in the summertime, we, I worked down there. And I wasn't supposed to wear a swing shift, but the bums had me working swing shift. <laughs> That's That's <laughs> Are there any other questions from the audience? We did receive several questions, but we can, we can turn it out here to the audience first. One thing that you had mentioned, which is important, I didn't say it, uh, actually, the reason that Charlie Schwab decided to uh, go with the coke ovens here was even more than the coke, it was the gas. Because, and somebody here mentioned, I think Eddie mentioned something about the gas. We supplied gas to the A&B gas company up to about 1953, which ended up being in the, the domestic gas when you had your gas range at home. But the gas was not quite as clean, so it would cause problems with blockages in the gas range. So kind of disappeared after that. But Schwab was more interested in the fuel for his his operation, the treating furnaces and so forth, and even the coke, because he could buy the coke uh, from other people. But the whole process just made a lot of sense here. 
it provided the energy, provided the coke, made a complete operation. We had another, oh, yeah. yes, sir. Without those gas tanks that when you go in the Hellertown, I remember as a kid, they were like collapsible and they would go up and down. Was that gas from the coke works? Some of it was gas. Yeah, I remember that because that was fascinating. The MGI still has a plant. Uh, you know, where the underpass used to be on Port 12, and they brought gas in from other sources around the country. But our gas also is injected into that stream. The ash of, of the coke, once it was used, there was a department called Steam, Water, and Air, and they would use it to run their co coal boilers. And the ash from there would then be uh, pumped into trucks, and then that would be used to make cinder blocks. of our family between hers and mine, and it's over 300 years between her and I and our families. Myself, I, my father and my uncles worked there in the plant too. My, my father, my uncle Jenny, my uncle Pete. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also had my father. Yeah, he worked uh, on top of the baggage where you saw. That's where he started. Uh, my brother, Red, my sister Kathy, my sister Nilsa, my wife, and uh, our two sons worked uh, summertime uh, when they were ready to move out of the house, which took a while. But, <laughs> but uh, like I said before, you know, coke was dirty and everything, but you know, it, it made our lives a lot easier. A lot easier. What about the, the gentleman that's behind Charlie? Oh, <laughs> the jacket back there uh, belonged to my dad. Uh, it kept him from getting burned. And, and if uh, after this over, you could go over and touch it, and it's very, very heavy. Very heavy. It's made out of wool. Would that be worn in the summer as well? All the time. Three layers of clothing. In the summertime, you wore two pairs of long johns. Yeah. <laughs> keep the heat from getting burned, man. Steel things in here? That would burn you. I asked, I asked John to be up here because, uh, um, you know, there's always someone that's a mentor for you. And when I came into the Coke Works, John was my mentor. And you know, everybody would tell you, crack jokes and give you misinformation. But he was somebody who would always give me information that would keep me safe, keep me out of danger. And uh, if I would have listened to him, I'd be the healthiest person in the world. Uh, but I didn't. But he always talked about making sure we wore our respirators. He always talked about where the danger was. He always, he just looked out for us dumb guys in such ways, and I never got an opportunity to thank him for that. I wanted to do that now. So, oh, Don. Once Bethlehem plant shut down, how far did you ship coke? We went to Sparrows Point. We did ship to Rouge Steel in Detroit area, whatever the town, in course, Michigan, something like that. Uh, Burns Harbor, obviously. Um, I don't recall how long Sparrows Point because they also were changing their operation. They were also getting a lot of Chinese coke because it was easier to ship it in from overseas by boat. And that, that was difficult. One of the problems, this video obviously at the end doesn't sound very good because we uh, were very optimistic with all the money that was spent by the company to upgrade facilities. But we didn't last very long after that. 
and uh, it, it's a sad story because of how much was spent and how hard the people worked to uh, maintain it. Um, I think in terms of, you were a metallurgist, I think, Tom, right? So you know where they're going today with blast furnaces, uh, less and less of them around, less and less coke ovens around, uh, hoping that electric furnaces are gonna solve our problem in the future. Uh, I'm concerned uh, about that. I'm, you probably know a lot more about that than I do, but uh, we, we were, I think, in great shape to continue. One of our reasons for, for not going further was we lost our best customer, which was Bethlehem's Blast Furnaces here. So that the people that were really getting uh, the best return were the railroads that were moving our material to Sparrows Point, to Burns Harbor, to Detroit, to other locations. And the coal, actually, and, and I know Carmen tried to figure out how we could get a canal up here to get barges with coal, but the coal also had to come from eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, Western Pennsylvania, great distances with uh, a lot of expense involved. So that the loss of the furnaces here was really critical to us, and uh, it's a shame. We had a lot of friends at the blast furnace. How much did the quality of coke in the industry vary, and was the Bethlehem Coke Works known for the quality within that? We actually did, and I think one of the reasons is we had some ovens that were pretty old. We also had an A battery that was new, but it did have some damage occurred to it up near the top of the oven. There was bulges. So we extended our coking time to a longer coking time, and that generally hurts you because the less productivity you have, the more expensive it is for that product. But we did it because we wanted to preserve the facility, and you saw bricklayers working on the ovens there. They rebuilt the ovens. They did a fantastic job. Our in-house bricklayers, fantastic group of people. Uh, so with the long coking rate, you get very large coke. The coke is very big, size of the cantaloupe down to you know baseball size, which is what the furnace wanted, something like a baseball size. So that was an advantage in ours, to make the bigger material. I think our quality could match anybody, although if you talk to any of the other coke ovens, they would probably disagree with that. But uh, it, was, it was great, I think, and, the, and the, the people operating here, the heaters were important because they had to heat the, the the mass, the coke mass correctly, which was a problem on the very first element. So I put ours up against anybody, but we lost our customer here. That hurt, that really hurt. But, you know, we just couldn't make up for that. The cost was too high. How long did the coke ovens last before they Originally, the coke ovens originally were a German concern, but as World War I was shaping up in Europe, uh, it was realized that this was going to be a problem because Deutsche Bank was the funding agency and it was a German company that built it. And uh, they had to sell it to, the, to Bethlehem Steel because it was going to be declared alien property uh, by the government, and that, that would have terminated the, the relationship. The Germans actually wanted the coal chemicals as much as they wanted anything. The coal was uh, something that was good for the furnaces, and Schwab wanted that. Primarily the gas he wanted. But, uh, the byproducts to the Germans were important because the Germans controlled the dye market at that time. Uh, the various chemical dyes, purple dyes and stuff, they, they had the technology and knew how to do it. And, and uh, The coal chemicals gave you an opportunity to get those dyes. They also made munitions. Toluene was one of our products that's used in explosives, TNT, trinitrile toluene. Uh, lots of different chemical value that was there that they wanted, but it then the war in Europe. Question. On the oxygen burners that they put on the heights area, 
How many years uh, did that exist? And what was the purpose of the oxygen? side of that, I think we need to get some. Okay, <laughs> I forget I'm doing this. Uh, the technical side, you'll probably need some people to know more about that process, but what, uh, it started in 68, I think, and it uh, would have gone to right at the time that the uh, blast furnaces went down, because the hot metal from the blast furnaces went to the BOF. Uh, BOF use of oxygen is a lot like the Bessemer process that was in uh, use for maybe a hundred years before that. <coughs> Bessemer steel making took a, a cupola furnace and shot air, not oxygen, but air into it. And it, it helped to dry the carbon off and, and refine it. And this is again, I ask Don on these kinds of things because he's more knowledgeable than I am. But uh, the BOF, because it used oxygen, was uh, more efficient and more productive than that. Don, do you want to? What was the question again? How many years did it exist? The oxygen furnace? The oxygen furnace here at this plant went into use in 1969. It was shut down in 95, so very important. Why did the, I know, uh, you know management create a lot of problems and also with the labor and all that stuff. Why would uh, our government not back us to keep our industry going? Because yeah, we made the war, uh, the ships for the war, and all by the other stuff. By the time you're we talking... Lost, we lost a great industry. But by the time you're talking about when Bethlehem Steel went to the government for help, we were no longer a prime industry. We were like a secondary it's industry. Because they gave it to the Japanese is what happened. I was, uh, you know, the front line and all those other guys, uh, Martin, and they all had invited all the Japanese to the country club. <laughs> and they had to gather together to get more technology. Why, why would they do that? <laughs> but that's why we lost the industry. That's right. You realize they tore a great community for the oxygen furnace. And that community consisted of many Europeans, you know, the Mexicans, etc. And they put the oxygen furnace up, and what does that do? There's um, there's a really wonderful display out in the lobby, um, Northampton Heights. So please take a look at that. To oh yes. So if you're interested a little bit in learning more about this community that Mike's talking about. Um, Did you live in the Heights for a while? I was a person of the city at the time. Jose, you had a question. Yeah, back to Coke stuff. I'm just curious, do you know where all the coke came from be before the Bethlehem Coke Works were put into place in 1912? Where was the coke coming from for the last few years? So I've been told we have to repeat the question so that everyone hears, but Jose has a really good question. Prior to the Lehigh Coke Company opening on that site, where was the coke coming, coming from for the blast furnaces? The, uh, if you've heard of Henry Clay Frick, That's what I was wondering. Henry Clay Frick is notorious for the Homestead strike in 1892, but he was second in command to Carnegie. He controlled the coke business in West, Western Pennsylvania with over 300, or I'm sorry, 3,000 uh, beehive ovens. The beehive coke making had a long history. The Chinese did something a thousand years ago to make coke with that process. Uh, and later it became applied to blast furnaces. But uh, Schwab could buy uh, Connellsville, <coughs> Connellsville, Pennsylvania is where the, the Frick had his main operation, and you could buy it. Some of the furnaces, even here at Bethlehem, up until 1900, and again, Don, you're going to correct me if I make a mistake here, but it, as, around 1900, uh, still 50% of the uh, coke 50% of the carbon burn, burden was coke. The other 50% was still anthracite. It was, it was not really taken uh, to be that important, although it was very important. It really improved the productivity. But you could buy, you could buy coke. It was available, even mom and pop type operations. The Chinese started that way, and again, I defer to Don who could maybe explain this more, but a lot of times, in the early years of use of Chinese coke, uh, 
uh, a lot of that was under no control at all. It was uh, family-run businesses, you know, they didn't care about the environment or whatever, but the Coke was cheap. And because it was cheap, it could be shipped here at a, at a reason, very low price, even though it, dis it kind of disintegrated in all of the handling and the process handling, you could still make do with it because you had so much uh, less cost involved. And, but that was the primary thing. There were other, uh, besides Frick and his Connellsville operation, there were other uh, beehive ovens all around. And that's a whole other subject that hopefully Andrea and Emily and the rest of the uh, folks here at the museum will cover one day, because that, that's an interesting story in itself. Thanks. Uh, you, uh, several of you talked about just how uh, in the beginning, and for most of the life of the Coke Works, it was a very dangerous and dirty place to work. And it's clearly that uh, there's some relationship between the recruitment um, to find workers to work in the Coke Works and just how dangerous and dirty the work was. Can you talk a little bit about the, the yeah. relationship there? Okay. So he's asking about the, the relationship for recruiting into the work. Well, one of the, the first thing that they do when I started to work at the cookwork, they gave you wooden shoes to wear on top of the other shoe. Also, they give you a special closet which you have to use on top of your regular closet. So it makes him hardest because of the heat, the dust, the fume. It was on not only the heat, but also the fumes, the dust. And then you had to walk one battery measure more than 250 foot long. And you had to walk on top of that with those wooden shoes. And uh, it was very hard. Not only the heat, but also to walk on top of that, that batteries. Bethlehem Steel was the second largest company in the country. They built the Empire State Building. They built the Washington Bridge, the Golden State Bridge in San Francisco. So, but the one thing they do, or oh, the government, when OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health, started to implement the clean air. That's when the company got in trouble, in trouble. So they had to bring new machinery. They had to put a steam on the ovens so that the flame, the dust, to hold that down on the ovens. And they forget, like I said, they forget about technology. Also, they have to compete with plastic. The cars are not made no longer of, of steel. So they had to compete with plastic, steel, with the, with the other company. But the, when OSHA tell them to stop that pollution, they gave them so long to do that. And when they don't do that, they, uh, they, they say, well, you don't meet the standards. Then we're gonna find you every day so much well, Charlie know about this. They're going to find you so much every day until you stop that pollution. Yeah, I worked in the cup Gardens for uh, almost 26 years till I got shipped down when they closed up here in Bethlehem. They shipped me down to Sparrows Point to to complete my my career, I should say. <laughs> but up here, when we, I was kind of fortunate because when I came to the Coke ovens, they had steam on the batteries. And I understand that from the older guys, they, they used to have to play the wind. They used to have to play the weather all the time because the fires were so high Sometimes they were higher than the machine that would put the coal in. So I was kind of fortunate then when I started, 
they used to put the steam on, the steam would suck down the, the fires, and you could at least throw your lids on the on the ovens a lot safer, and, and you wouldn't be, uh, have to play the win or anything, but it was still dirty, but it was a lot, it was a lot better than it was before. The other, the predecessors that were there, with it. I remember they had an old Larry car on one battery, and that thing, they used to have to use the shakers, but they used the shakers, the coal sometimes when it used to get wet, they used to stick to the hoppers on the side. So the shakers would have to, oh, the guy would have to work, break his back trying to move that coal to, so it could feed down into the ovens. But the, the, the mechanical gang here, somebody came up with the idea of getting the shakers to work with hydraulics. And then it was a lot easier. To me, it seemed, I mean, it was still hard work, but it was a lot easier physically than it was, like, let's say, when Ishmael started and when his, his dad used to work there and his dad. I did so that's what I wanted to say uh, about the coke ovens. When I was there, it was still dirty, it was still hot, it was still, uh, you still had to work out in the weather, you, the snow, and you freeze up there in the, in the wintertime, you would freeze, in the summertime, you'd boil up there. You know, we used to have like buckets that we used to set on the battery to slurry the, the lid shut so it wouldn't smoke, control the pollution. Well, when it was cold outside, those buckets sitting on top of the battery would freeze up like a block of ice. That's how cold it was up there sometimes. But, you know, you work with what you got, and you just keep working, that's all. All right, thank you. That's good. And the other thing you mentioned about freezing the mud, we also sealed doors with mud. Initially, when Ishmael was there, there was mud, mud slurry. A Luderman sealed the door to prevent emissions. But later, we went back to that design because it was the only positive way of shutting the smoke off from the doors leaking. It was and, an and, yeah, you had to. And the way you tested is you threw a lump up on the ceiling. If it stuck, it, it was good. But they would add rock salt to it in the winter time to keep it from freezing on the batteries. And that stuff, when it got on the doors, it like like concrete, it would not come off. You couldn't even get the doors off sometime because the, the salt made a difference in how it operated. But uh, excellent. But you look, you still look fantastic considering all the stuff. All of you guys look fantastic. I, I, want, I want to address the question that I think, I think he was asking about why did people work where they work? And language played a part of it. I believe language played a part of where people worked. I believe you didn't need to know English in many parts of the of the steel plant, and and uh, skills like it seemed like the Germans had the mills and the finished. In fact, they used to say uh, the mills got paid the most because they were the finished product. I could never understand that. That, but so the coke workers got the least amount of money, but they they would do that. So they would have it by Italians. I think were carpenters. Uh, Germans were in the mills. They would break it out by, by, by groups and by languages throughout the plant in the earlier days. Yeah, it was, it was somebody that said that the Spanish could work in the coke works because they can handle the heat better. They had labor camp inside the, the plant and the company store. You know, and, but that was the, the old Mexicans that worked there in, back in the days. But they lived inside the plant because they didn't want them going outside. This is a question for anybody who was working here when the coke work shut down. But Charlie, you mentioned a, a very specific date when the operations closed. And I'm just wondering, how was that date, whenever it was known, how was that date communicated to everyone? <coughs> We're wrapping up. Was it was a meeting? Was it a memo? What, what was it? Talked in the washrooms. 
we had people come to the washroom and we explained that. It was obviously a shock to people because, uh, as the video shows, we thought we had a greater future because of the fact that so much money was spent. You know, if you were in a management position to, to defend what they're doing, why spend all that money if you didn't want to operate? And, that, and again, we lost our prime customer. That, that hurt when the blast furnaces went down here at Belton. But it was communicated through that kind of thing. We, we had an internal uh, newsletter called the Coke Sacker. The Coke Sacker sometimes has connotations of uh, you know, not too good language, but in the early years of uh, Coke production, it was used for domestic uh, heating, uh, for furnaces and so forth, and it was sold in bags either canvas bags or paper bags or burlap bags. So Coke Sacker terminology was a term of endearment because you were there for a long time if you were a Coke Sacker. And that term is gone. Nobody can really remember that anymore. But we keep it alive on our, our marquee. But uh, We tried to explain it, but you can imagine it was not easy to explain after all the hard work that the people here put into it and, and others that aren't here. There, there were a lot of others. There's one fellow that I had invited, John Muskinung. John's family goes back to the Bethlehem Iron Company, like 20 or 30 different relatives, the first being an iron master for Bethlehem Iron. A long, long generation. It's hard to explain to people after you've had all of this effort that you weren't going to continue. One last follow-up. How long was it from the time it was communicated to that closing? Like, was that... Weeks, months, days? Uh, I'd say about three months is what I recall. I, I don't precisely remember. Uh, I don't. Wait, I, they had a 90 day agreement. You had to tell yeah. us by contract. Yeah. 90 days, you know, they told you, and then you guys knew. Yeah. It's coming through that. Mm -hmm. Maybe a week. And it's interesting to note that the slideshow that you have here was during those last several months. Uh, the uh, photographer, Joe Elliott, went around the Coke ovens and recorded what he saw. Yeah, it was June, uh, it was June of 98, uh, the time we left there. We ran the, the Coke, those three months we ran the Coke belts in the opposite direction. So we had to babysit them. Make sure those steps stay running. The whole process actually in closing the plant down it took a while. Uh, again, gas is a is a key product of the coke ovens, and all those gas mains had to be purged. And a lot of the guys in here did that kind of work. It was done successfully with no fatalities or or, or any serious injuries to people. But if you did that wrong, you would end up with a terrible explosion. The city of Belthium uh, had to respond to a fire in our scrubbers, which are, were on one of those pictures. The scrubbers took the light oil and, and uh, I shouldn't say the light oil, took the gas and sprayed the uh, uh, gas with water and with uh, petroleum wash oil and recovered light oil. But there was a sludge in the bottom and the fire company had to respond to a fire and they they were surprised because they did not know how to attack the problem. It was, it, they had to call people in to understand what to do. You had to smother it. You couldn't, it would just keep burning. It was petroleum sludge, basically. It was interesting comment too about uh, the accident records and stuff. I've gone through the accident records. Some of that has been adopted by the, the uh, memorial, Sea Workers Memorial for uh, people. There were a large number of fatalities over the years, but the unusual thing is, as dangerous as a Coke oven was with mobile equipment going around and people working around Larry cars and pushers and all of this stuff, the real cause for most of those fatalities was asphyxiation because people would go in without necessarily knowing there's a gas hazard involved in the early days. Later, you know, there were improvements. We even had some mistakes at that time too in 73. But it was, it was more than just the machinery. It was the environment that people had to worry about. And obviously what was mentioned about the temperatures and stuff, that, that was important too, just keeping people 
from peeling over and dying, but, but asphyxiation, surprisingly, out of the number of people at this I just heard that there was an announcement. Those of you who are in the 3 p.m. Steelworkers Archives tour, walking tour, um, they will be gathering in the lobby. So, yes. Any other? Uh, Talking about gas, the A battery used to burn 500,000 cubic foot per hour. 500 cubic foot of gas an hour. That's how much gas that battery used to burn. But gas is very dangerous. When uh, you got gas connection to your house, I think the pipe is maybe two inches. Imagine one inch. Well, uh, and sometimes they knock a house, a house down, one explosion. Uh, be a hitting man is a big, big responsibility because you are in charge of the most dangerous situation in the cockpit. So the main thing they tell you is that you have to Give pressure on your line. The gas with pressure don't do it burn, but it doesn't explode. So uh, it's a, a big, big responsibility, and uh, you have a different uh, way to measure your pressure and also your gas consumption of the battery. So it's a, a big responsibility. So you are in charge of the the whole. Cockwell. One time I told the superintendent on the Cockwell that uh, if we have an explosion on the battery, he wasn't no, no safer than I was working on the battery in the office because uh, that, that would be a terrible thing to have explosion of, of that uh, many cubic foot of gas that you use. We make the gas and we, we use the gas, like I told Charlie. Well, uh, when we make the gas, it goes through the softer house. I never been on a softer house. And then they send the gas, the gas back again to use the, the gas. So we make gas and we use gas. You know, they've talked about the houses had one-inch pipes. What were the sizes of our pipes? Forty-two inch The other thing that was interesting with what you're talking about, the exhauster house, there was a whistle at the exhauster house, a steam whistle. When there was an emergency somewhere in the coal plant, whether it was at coal handling or wherever, there was a signal system that said if there was a problem. When you heard one long, that meant there was something happening at the exhauster house. It's probably one of the few places in the plant where people ran to the exhauster house instead of sitting back and waiting what was happening because they were responding to try to help whatever the problem was. But it, it was, a, again, a tremendous workforce that was willing to go that extra mile to help us. Yes, Bill and Reed, volunteer. Uh, I've always had the question on the basic procedure or scientific application of how you bake the coal, but you don't get a runaway fire of burning the coal. So you have a controlled process here of, you know, coal likes to burn. You got fire in the, in the oven. How are you controlling that? That's a great question. That, that critical balance so that you actually get a product at the other end and not ash. How do you bake the coal without burning the coal? Yes. Actually, to tell you, the, the coal was not burned exactly with with a flame. The flame didn't come anywhere near the coal. The only thing that, that cooked that, it was like baking a cake. They would put the coal in between. The walls were the ones that were heated up. They had flues going up with, that would burn that gas and heat up the wall, the bricks. And that's what would bake the coke. The coke would get hot by itself, you know, once you put enough heat on something, it's gonna get hot, and it's gonna look like cherry red. But 
the coal itself didn't come in contact with any flame as, as per se on the battery. The battery didn't produce any flame on the coal. The walls were the ones that were heated up. And, they, and were, they were all like a little... But the temperature you're putting the coal at, what is the ignition temperature of coal that, that you didn't overstep that temperature, now all of a sudden you get instantaneous ignition? Well, Ismael could tell you more about that. The, the heaters used to, to use a, a scope. Well, uh, uh, you as a heater man, you take the temperature in every oven every day, and you maintain an average. If the oven is too hot, then you cut the gas. If it's too cold, you raise the gas in each oven. And this is the way that uh, that work. So you have to be careful because you do some kind of jobs over there that you have to cut the gas to 10 millimeters to do so, like swap the lines, and it's very dangerous. But uh, like I say, uh, th that gas catch fire just with the air. You don't have to put a match. You, you, they just, it, it, that gas burn without any match, or uh, they just catch fire with the air. And sometimes when they catch fire, but then we, when we do that job of swabbing, so we cut the gas to 10 millimeters. And uh, so it's less gas. And sometimes it does catch fire on the lines. But then you have to smother the fire with your, with your glove. And uh, it's a very dangerous job. That's what they pay you the highest position on the cockroach. The heater, man, uh, <clears throat> the heater job is above the electrician and mechanics. And uh, they train people for heater for six months. To become a heater, they have to train you. Uh, they train you for six months. But first, you have to pay two tests. First one is for first helper and one for heater. But they train you for six, six months. They train many people over there for that job. Was there any attempt at at putting mechanical or electronic regulation through valves and servo mechanisms rather than having that as a manual job function. Coke ovens operated with no air infiltration. So the only way you could avoid what you're talking about. Uh, the doors were put on, coal is charged in and obviously it's displacing air as it's going in there. Yep. The doors are put on, the lids were sealed up on the top and then as, as uh, Ishmael described and Eddie Serrano uh, described the heat was in the walls, in the flues. Right. Yep. But there was a back pressure control that kept the gas controlled, so there was always pressure on the ovens, very small pressure, you know, right. a few millimeters, 10, 15 millimeters of back pressure. On the other side, you went to the exhauster house and those engines were drawing it. So the butterfly valves controlled that back pressure so that you wouldn't infiltrate air. Otherwise, you would catch it on fire. And part of the problem with the original ovens was the brick was uh, fire clay instead of silica. Air was sucked in on the outside and it would slag the brick. You, you can't do that. You gotta keep the air out of the oven. But the temperature in the oven was was that manual controlled as far as the gas? Initially the it was. The old German batteries were built like that, but later it was controlled with something called an Escania uh, for uh, control of the gas pressure. But like uh, Ishmael had mentioned, they had to check on that to make sure that the temperature is reading. There's 32 flues across the wall. And uh, depending on the kind of battery design it was, it was either uh, firing or it was not firing. But they would check and make sure that everything was copacetic on that. Every little, every little right. right. Inspection caps. They inspect. Then you had to keep no less than 10 millimeters of head pressure. Not less than that. Otherwise, you're going to have the flow. Yeah. But 
the, the controls came. They got better as time went on with the design, but you did not want air in the oven because then you would get exactly what you're worried about. You'd, you'd combust the coal. And that was part of the problem with the original beehive ovens because the beehive ovens were just a pile like an igloo. Imagine an igloo, you probably know this already, but uh, pile up coal, maybe seven feet, eight feet high and big diameter, covered with like a, a dirt or whatever to keep it there. And they would ignite it in the center. You put a pole in it, pull the pole out and ignite in the center. But the efficiency of that was very poor because it did burn. There was no way to control it like a refractory oven. Thanks, guys. Yeah, sure. yeah. I do remember weather conditions uh, controlled like the tar when it got really cold outside. How uh, we would have to put extra people on there to help them with the tar. I remember that was a couple of years ago. Arches. Yeah. 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 Because of the, the, these kind of uh, conditions and uh, problems that you would have to deal with all the time. Um, it seems like a couple of you mentioned how important it was to work together and look out for one another. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to be on a, on a shift with the same people working together? Yeah. Watching the each question other is working together and how it was working together with different groups of people. Eddie? I want to see. I want to tell you a funny story. I don't know. Is there anybody here that ever worked in the fire department for Bethlehem Steel? Not you, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is funny. One time we had a fire up in the governor house up on a battery. We uh, were on a ship. Uh, we, you don't want to have a fire up the governor house because that's where all the gas is collected and sent out to the to the byproduct side. So they, it was a pretty good fire. So we ran up there and they said, oh, we're going to need the fire department. They said, oh, yeah, call the, the Bethlehem Steel Fire Department. Here to come the fire department. They're trashing everything. So they pull up on the thing and the guy goes, where's the fire? Up there, up on the governor house. He said, oh, OK. The one guy goes to here. Here's a bag, you go upstairs and you throw the thing down. The, they had a rope in there, you throw the rope down and then we'll hook up the hoses and we'll pull them up. He said, okay. So the guy ran up the steps, doo -doo -doo -doo, all the way up to the top of a battery. And what happened? The guy grabs the bag and he throws the whole bag down. <laughs> He don't throw the rope down, he throws the whole bag down. And the guy down there, what am I going to do with this? He said, well, you told me to throw the bag down. No, you goofy. I'm supposed to throw the rope down, not the bag. <laughs> so the other guy had a quick run up there to get the bag. And then, he, and then he's feeding it down. He's feeding it down the side of the battery. Well, when he gets to the bench area, where where the bench pen works, well, there's another level that has to go down to the ground. Well, that rope stayed there because no, nobody got to the bench area. The guy down there couldn't get the rope either. I said, man, these guys look like the Keystone Cops. <laughs> but it, by the time we had, by the time they were done messing around, we already had to fire out up on the governor house. We already, we put it out ourselves. We didn't even need them. <laughs> There was a lot of interplay between the folks. I mean, some of the best cooks in the Lehigh Valley were part of the, of the crews. Uh, they uh, worked together as a team because with the machinery... Uh, Nelson's dad was the best cook. Okay. Carmen, does he cook as well? He's, yeah. He, uh, okay. When he wants. <laughs> But uh, you work together for shifts. Uh, the regular crews would be working together so long. They spent more time in the plant than they did with their families. And uh, you got a, a close relationship. That was your family. You grew up with your family at, at the job. You did see your, your spouse or your children occasionally, but most of the time it was with that crew. They were watching for you. They were watching if you were gonna step in the wrong place, uh, what was gonna happen. 
they, they knew the dangers around them. And, and that was really important for, like in the oven section in particular, where there was a lot of machinery, or coal handling, where there was a lot of machinery moving around. In coal chemicals, it was a little different. Again, the people had to watch out for each other, but there, a misstep could, misstep could cause an explosion or a fire of serious consequence. So everybody really did watch out for each other. It was a, it was a great organization, truly. Really. Talk about the guys getting along together. When we used to finish up night shift, and the guys that were to start night shift would be that. But we used to have pit roast down at Socket Park before the, you know, when the guys coming out of the shift and the guys going to the shift, we would roast pigs down at Socket Park. And that was like a common thing for us. Well, yeah, it depended. Uh, if you were on a battery side, uh, they had the me uh, mechanics that worked through shifts. Uh, the weld shop and the machine shop where I was uh, was steady day. Yeah, weekend, weekends off. <laughs> uh, they were saying about my dad cooking up. Uh, that's another thing that you were asking. The guys were so good that they would cover for him. But when it was all done, they Not loved the this food. He, he was a great cook. They actually brought him flowers in on Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the picture, uh, my dad's, uh, I think it was Four Gang. They used to have a. Uh, they used to have a picnic every year, pig rolls up in the, I don't know if you're familiar with Sucking Park, the, the top pavilion. I have a picture there of the gang. I'm trying to re remember uh, the guy's name. It's been such a long time. But they really, they, they couldn't wait for that picnic. But I'm telling you, and more drinking than eating. <laughs> <laughs> Picnic pitcher? Is that what? Is it? Okay. You know, there's a lot of good that came out of that. And I know they talk about the Hispanic Center coming out of the Puerto Rican Beneficial Society coming out of that. Another thing that came out of that, that um, the guys would talk about their families, you know, and they would say, um, my child's having trouble in school, they're saying this about them. And then the other person would say, what's well, funny, they're saying the same thing about my child. And another one would say, yeah, they're saying my child's too dumb for college. And all of a sudden they would realize that they were all Puerto Ricans and they were all in the same school district and they were all telling them the same thing. And, you know, then they would organize and then they would go and speak to someone, and Don Imai was part of those groups that would say, um, that's not right, you need to do something different. But a lot of good came out of, of the fact that they were put together where they would be able to compare notes and compare how well things were, how they, well things weren't. And uh, I don't want us to lose that side. Uh, I, I'll always say this, they, they took lemons and made lemonade out of the lives that we have. I think we should ask Carmen to talk a little bit about something that is more important than maybe what you've been hearing so far, and that is we had to start with something, and Carmen was our coal purchasing person. Uh, we had... I was going to take that term when you're okay. done. Sorry. No, that's okay. Okay. My wife does it. Oh. <laughs> you're Carmen. I feel like Phil Donahue. <laughs> I really don't have too much to say. <laughs> Stand up. Yeah. Um, yes, I took pleasure in sending in the coal that was so vitally needed to make the greatest coke for the blast furnace. And don't blame me if you lived on the south side <laughs> and you had to wait and wait as the train went down because some of those cars that carried the 
coal were like a hundred cars long and you had a long wait to get there. But it was a totally necessary thing and uh, it was my pleasure. You, you went to some of the mines? You... Yes, thank you, Charlie. Uh, yes, I had the pleasure of and the privilege to be able to go down in one of the mines. I went down the height of Martin Tower before it got knocked down the other way. Uh, so that was an experience and a half. And I also got to see uh, two other mines. I got to see the Panther Valley anthracite mine. And I remember going, we didn't use anthracite, but I, I don't know whether they used it, but, but Panther Valley, I remember the trucks were so huge that a tire was way up here. One of the tires for the truck was higher than than this. It was, I had pictures, but I don't know what happened to them. And I also got to see um, High Power Mountain, which was supposed to be our gemstone. Uh, and it ended up being sold after so many years uh, because of, uh, it went to Massey Coal. And that was another thing that triggered the end of the mining group. That's all. Did Bethlehem Steel buy from any other suppliers other than Bethlehem Steel owned mines? Yes. They, uh, they got them from, I only know which ones, Charlie, do you know where else? But um, we used to just supply, because they needed the mid ball, high ball, and low ball to make the proper cake mix. Uh, so, um, I know when I worked at Bethel Mines, um, we shipped mid ball and low ball and high. And, uh, what is but, that short for? Volatile. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, uh, there were other, other places that they got coal from, but I'm not really sure. Okay. Yes. I remember Courtney Foos, I don't, I don't think you caused this one, but there was, uh, we got some coal one time at Courtney Foos, and it's so oxidized, you can grab it in your hands and crush it. That was not culpable yeah. coal. <laughs> but uh, the, the Bethlehem mines were the primary suppliers. You had high vol coal coming from West Virginia, the Marion Mines, Marion 44 and 41, or you'd have it from Western Pennsylvania, Ellsworth uh, Mines, and a, and a division of theirs, Butler, uh, was there. Elkhorn was Eastern Kentucky coal. It was very hard coal. It didn't coke as well as the others, but you could blend it in and make it work. And then the, the real prime coal was low, vol low volatile coal, was uh, like a rebar, in a, in a coal mix. Uh, research found that there was like tiny little things that looked like rebars that held that coke mass together. So the reason the coke was strong was adding low volume coal. So you mixed all three of those in a certain percentage because if you put too much in, then Ishmael would have trouble on his eye and because the, uh, the coke would stick in the oven, it wouldn't come out. Too much low volume coal expands and it would jam in there, and you couldn't, you'd have to dig it out, which is not uh, good. If you don't have enough low vol, then you would have so much gas, there would be less product, less stuff that goes to the blast furnace. So it was really an art, starting at coal handling with, uh, you know, Bob Hoffman talked about that a little bit in, in the video. It really was like baking a cake. You had to know what you were doing. And of course, the mining folks really had to know what they were doing. They worked with research as we did to make sure we got the right kind of uh, coals in, in coming in. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for sending us uh, nothing coals. <laughs> well, um, are there any other questions for the panel? Or are there any other um, information stories that any of our panelists would like to share? Oh, we do have questions. Yes. How many people here are from the Heights? 
How many people are from the Northampton Heights neighborhood? Louie. Yeah, one, yeah, two, three. <laughs> yes, sir. Where? Yeah, I just read about the historical marker. Yes. And I was uh, rounding the corner uh, before you hit the forge looking for that sign today. Yeah. The historical marker was just yeah. erected in last year as I read on the World the, the Wide Web, and marker, now I don't see it. The historical marker was a disaster. If you read it, you know, if you're from the Heights, okay? If you're not from the Heights, you wouldn't understand what I'm saying. So it was, a. Uh, I don't know. I just, uh, you can get some more information out with the South Bethlehem Historical Society. So if you want don't. to get to see the historical marker, you know, get out there and, and read it. And reading what you read is not what I know. Don, you have a question. I'll just say the historical marker right out here in the corner has yeah. some very bad errors in it. Uh, so nobody wants and to correct it. That's why um, you're on our proofreading committee when we, <laughs> when we put things together for print. To get you but, the heist. Know what say about the whatever, whatever went on in the city, they knew about it in the heights. <laughs> yeah. Anything. If you want to find somebody, talk to the heights, and they will When I started to work at Bellingham Steel, I make one dollar an hour, and then they pay you every two weeks. Uh, so, so. Uh, Things were cheaper, like the gasoline, maybe 20 cents a gallon, and, and uh, everything. But I, I was better off. Make uh, when they see with the prices now, and what I made the last time, I make about forty thousand dollars the last year. So I made better with forty thousand dollars than uh, when the things are expensive. That's when I started at one dollar an hour. And from that dollar, they did not you the penny of the city at that, that time. Social security and federal taxes. So you have too much left. Uh, but I only pay $45 for a three-room apartment, so that helped too. How much, how much did you pay for a glass of beer back then? Oh, you, you could have, maybe the, the question you could have asked is how many lived in the south side? That oh, might have been a different kind of How many grew up and lived and grew up in the south side, South Bethlehem? That's a good Nice. So we have a number of artifacts on display in the, in the back of the room, in the front of the room here. And um, you know, please continue, please come up and we can continue the conversation. For those of you who have other places to get to, um, you're welcome to uh, you know, go around to the exhibits outside, outside in Foundry Park. And I will mention that at 4 p.m. we have a really incredible screening of a film, an independent original film put together by Bruce Ward and Billy Nichol Smith. And so if you talk about old timers, in that film, it has it all. And um, Bruce dedicated many years with Billy Nichol Smith putting that together. Um, it's a, a very balanced portrayal of the experience really spanning most of the 20th century. So it's an incredible film. And it's actually going to be the first time it's been screened in almost 20 years. So we will have that here at 4 p.m. So I would like to thank all of our panelists here and thank you for the hard work and for uh, explaining a little bit more to us today about what it was really like. Any last comments or memories that you'd like to relay? It was nice to see all these guys. Yeah. That's all right. Is my help? Would you like to say something? Oh, okay. No, no, we're good. We're good here. You're okay. All right. Yeah, I think you know. For the first time, it was the first time for some of you doing something like this, and you were pros. This was great. So thank you. Thank you.